Whenever falling in love with that one person they are destined to be with, the common belief would often have people saying that it was love at the first gaze. But somewhere deep inside, the ancient Greeks actually knew who was responsible for this. As the goddess of love and beauty, Aphrodite is regularly attended by Eros, the personification of amorous desire who fulfills his purposes by inspiring love in gods and mortals alike. He is the god of love and lust whose name signifies physical or sexual love, and from which the word erotic is derived. Most of us are certainly more familiar with Cupid his Roman counterpart, who later merged with the Greek god Eros and represent the equivalent of a more in Latin poetry. The representations of Eros do vary quite often, but we know him in literature as being usually depicted as a winged archer bearing the traits of a naked beautiful young man, or a playful cherubic little boy who fires arrows into the hearts of those he wishes to become lovers. The Greek god Eros is sometimes painted with a garland of flowers made of typical roses, and appears during wedding scenes or in the company of Aphrodite. In post-classical paintings, he is shown in views of romantic love whether reciprocated just like Aphrodite and Adonis, or unrequited love as in the case of Echo and Narcissus. Although the god can quite often be seen fluttering around in seduction or abduction portrayals on attic vessels, he is seldom introduced into mythical narratives emerging for the most part in later writings and in a subordinate role as part of the divine machinery for making one person fall in love with another. There are multiple versions of the god's parentage. The Hesiod's Theogony holds that Eros is one of the archetypal gods, the child of Chaos and brother of Gaia, Erebus, Nyx and Tartarus. While in Aristophanes' Birds, Eros was born from an egg of Erebus and Nyx and believed to have emerged with wings of gold. After initially presenting him as a primordial cosmogonic power, the Theogony later reports that Eros overpowers the rational thought of mortals and immortals alike. He attended Aphrodite from the time of her birth and accompanied the goddess later to Olympus when she ascended to join the other gods. In the subsequent literature, he is often tied to her even more closely as being not merely her attendant but her son, with the idea appearing for the first time in a fragment from Simonides, which describes him as being the merciless child whom Aphrodite bore to the god Ares. The god Eros had a counterpart or a double love deity in Anteros, a divinity associated with unrequited love and love avenged. He is physically depicted as similar to Eros in every way, but with long hair and plumed butterfly wings. The god has also been described as being armed with either a golden club or arrows of lead. He symbolizes the rationale understanding that love must be answered if it's meant to prosper. Therefore, Anteros is mostly seen as a vengeful deity in charge of punishing those who ignored the love of others. The god of love is believed to also manifest as multiple figures called Arides, which is a collective of winged gods related to love and sexual intercourse. They are thought to have been the offspring of Zephyr the West Wind, and Iris the Rainbow whose colors represent the variegated passions of love. Among them too are mentioned as companions of Aphrodite are the personifications of amorous yearning. We have Himeros whose name means much the same as that of Eros, he attended Aphrodite from her birth along with Eros and his abode lay on Olympus close to those of the Muses. While Pothos, the god of sexual longing and desire enters the literary record somewhat afterwards but then appears much more frequently. Some sources refer to him unequivocally as a personified being, mentioning him together with Patho as a child and assistant of Aphrodite, a purely decorative and allegorical being with no associated myths at all. The overwhelming seductive power of Eros was known to be universal and there was no realm or boundary that he cannot breach. His arrows can cause a frenzy of passion, such as the painful and an unnatural love of a mother for her stepson, it can bewitch and confuse its victim. But Eros's youthful mischievousness is often rebuked by Aphrodite, who scolds him for causing so much trouble among the Olympian gods and mortals with his indiscriminate use of the arrows of love. 
However, to meet her convenience and cast her victims into her nets, Aphrodite doesn't hesitate to use the power of the god of love to serve her deeds. One notable myth about it is manifested in the popular tale of Eros and the beautiful Psyche. Once lived a king who had three lovely daughters, but the youngest Psyche excelled her sisters that beside them she almost seemed like a goddess consorting with mere mortals. The fame of her surpassing beauty spread all over the kingdom, and became so admired that men traveled from all over to lay their eyes upon her with such adoration and wonder. Homage would be paid to her as if she was a divinity incarnated among them. After seeing her the people would often say that even Aphrodite couldn't equal the beauty of this mortal. As they thronged in ever-growing numbers to worship her loveliness, no one anymore gave a thought to the goddess Aphrodite. Her temples were neglected and abandoned, her altars covered with cold ashes, her favorite towns deserted then started falling in ruins while the sculptors decided to no more make statues of her. This situation inevitably drew the envious attention of Aphrodite who grew jealous and would not put up with this treatment any longer. Whenever the goddess was disturbed she would turn to her son for help. The god against whose weapon there is no defense neither on earth nor in heaven. In distress, Aphrodite told him about Psyche's wrongdoing and as always he was ready to do her bidding. She sent Eros to wreak vengeance on her telling him to make her fall in love with the most despicable creature there is in the whole world. But the plan went wrong the moment he looked upon her, then felt his heart pierced by one of his arrows, succumbing to his own weapon and immediately fell in love with the beautiful Psyche. He couldn't make such a charming maiden fall in love with a horrible creature as Aphrodite planned, however the god decided to keep it secret from his mother, fearing for her wrath and the possibility to forever lose the love of his life. Interesting enough Psyche was surprisingly lonely, not only she couldn't fall in love with someone, but due to her extreme beauty no men dared to court her. They were only satisfied with admiring and worshipping her then passed by to marry other women. Both her sisters definitely less seductive were already married to renowned kings, while the all-beautiful Psyche remained in a solitary sadness, she was only admired but never loved. This was of course disturbing for her parents who finally consulted an oracle of Apollo on how to get her a good husband. They were told to expose Psyche in bridal robes on top of a mountain, where her destined husband would come to claim his bride. But according to the oracle this would be a dreadful winged serpent more powerful than the gods themselves. Upon hearing the terrible prophecy her family couldn't contain their sorrow, but nevertheless prepared the beautiful princess to face what they thought would be her death. No one could ever imagine the despair felt by her family and friends, when they led the young lady to the mountain as if she was to be drive to her tomb. It was in tears that they all departed leaving Psyche to her fate, and locked themselves inside the castle to mourn her for the rest of their days. Desperately being left alone, Psyche seated and waited in fear until she was carried away by the gentle breathing of Zephyr, the sweetest and mildest of all winds. She was floating from the rocky hilltop to a deep valley until laying upon a grassy meadow soft as a bed and fragrant with flowers. This turned out to be a magical palace built for a god, with pillars made of gold and walls of silver, and floors inlaid with precious stones where she was tended by invisible servants. An isolated place where Eros visited the girl in her bedroom and made love to her in the dark without revealing his identity. The whole day she was alone only accompanied by the invisible servants, but somehow she knew that her husband would come home at night. When she felt him beside her body and heard his voice softly murmuring in her ear, all her worries disappeared. She knew without seeing him that there was no shape of terror nor that of a monster, but the husband and lover she has been waiting for her whole life. The following days were filled with the joy of the two lovers. Although she was happier than she has ever been before, Psyche started to feel bored and sad because she was unable to see the man she has been spending her days with. 
then suddenly started missing her family which must have been mourning for her since, but still wasn't aware that she was alive and happy. Not fully content with this life she demanded to see both her beloved sisters. The god wasn't pleased with the thought of it but then allowed them to see each other against his better judgment. He warned Psyche about the danger in the shape of her sisters, which could possibly make them go through so much suffering, but she promised to ignore anything that might endanger their relationship. When the two sisters arrived and entered the palace, a bitter jealousy took possession of them seeing the fortune belonging to their younger sister. They started asking questions concerning the look and her husband's occupation, Psyche just said that he was a hunter. Her sisters obviously didn't believe it because there's no such hunter who could claim to possess so much wealth. Obsessed by the big difference existing between their happiness and wealth, the two sisters sow the seeds of panic by suggesting that her mysterious husband is in reality the hideous snake mentioned by the oracle, which could explain why he doesn't let her see him and would ultimately swallow her alive if she ever does. Driven by the envy and curiosity inoculated by her envious sisters, Psyche one night light up a candle on the god while brandishing a knife to kill him if she happens to uncover a dreadful monster. To her surprise the light didn't show a hideous creature, but a winged man of surpassing beauty and fell even more in love than ever. She was unable to deny herself the bliss of filling her eyes with such loveliness. But unfortunately, she inadvertently dropped some hot candle wax upon his shoulder which woke him up in pain and saw the light while facing her distrust. Without a single word he left the bedroom then fled away. Psyche immediately ran after her husband, but in the first shame of her folly and lack of faith, she fell on her knees while watching him getting further away into the dark sky. Although she couldn't almost see him, she could hear his heartbroken voice confessing who he was in reality then sadly bade her farewell. Love can't possibly live in a place where there's no trust. Overcome by regret and longing, the unfortunate Psyche roamed the world in search of him. She had no idea where to even start, the only thing she knew was that she would never give up looking for him. Whether or not Eros still had some love left for her didn't matter anymore, Psyche was ready to spend the rest of her existence proving how much she loves him regardless of what he now feels about her, then started her journey. In her despairing wandering she tried to win the gods over by offering them perpetual prayers, but none of them would do anything to make Aphrodite their enemy. Psyche realized that there was no hope left for her and humbly offered herself to Aphrodite as her servant in the attempt to soften her anger, however the goddess was still furious and determined to show the girl what it meant to draw down the displeasure of a divinity. So she forced her to undertake four seemingly impossible tasks if she wanted to be forgiven and regain the affection of Eros, otherwise she will just lose him forever. Psyche agreed then followed the goddess on a hill, where awaited what would be her first task. There the goddess showed her a large heap of small seeds and grains that she was to separate into its different components in a single day. This was indeed a cruel labor that filled her eyes with tears, but at this direful moment, she who had awakened no compassion from the gods was pitted by the tiniest creatures of the field. A colony of ants was passing by and saw the girl in a such despair that they took pity by separating the seeds and from the big original heap they formed few smaller ones which allowed Psyche to achieve the labor. Next morning, the young girl was told to get some shining wool from a flock of homicidal sheep living nearby a river. But as she reached the flowing stream, Psyche heard a little voice from near her feet then bent over the water. Looking down, she saw that it was coming from a green reed telling her to wait until the sheep came out of the bushes toward evening to rest beside the river, after which she could go into the grove and collect plenty of the golden wool hanging on the thorns of the surrounding plants. Following the given directions, Psyche was able to carry back to Aphrodite a substantial amount of the shining fleece. Psyche not failing to her tasks was upsetting Aphrodite quite much. So she sent the girl to fetch a jar of water from the sacred streams of the river Styx. When she approached the waterfall Psyche realized that this would probably be the most dangerous of her trials. 
So steep and slippery were the rocks on all sides, and so fearful was the onrush of the descending waters. Successfully venturing down this waterfall wasn't possible for a simple mortal like herself and she believed that only a winged creature could reach it. Although each of her tasks seemed impossibly hard, an excellent way out of it has always been provided for her. This time her savior was an eagle that was flying above the river when it saw the girl beside it, then seized the jar from her with its beak and brought it back full of the black water. Having succeeded to her previous trials showed the young girl's determination but Aphrodite wasn't having it. She was persuaded that Psyche did nothing but received help from others, and decided to shake her off the resolution of moving forward. She was given a box and finally sent to the underworld to drain some of Persephone's beauty. Obediently as always, the girl went forth looking for the road leading to Hades. But this was not a place that could easily be found by a mere mortal and was about to give up, when she was given instructions on how to safely pass through the underworld from completely unexpected sources. On her way down to the kingdom of the dead, she ultimately encountered the ferryman who took her across the river Acheron in exchange of a coin. From there the road led straight to the palace of Hades and Persephone. Being aware of what brought the young girl to her abode, Persephone was willing to do Aphrodite this one favor, then filled the box allowing Psyche to quickly return in the hope that she would finally be reunited with her one true love. But disaster struck when she let her curiosity get the better of her by opening the casket to see what was that beauty charm in the box, and perhaps use a little for her own good to make herself more lovely for when she'd meet Eros. To her sharp disappointment there was nothing inside the container, she was immediately overcome by a death-like laziness then fell into a heavy slumber, the poor girl has been tricked by Aphrodite and will forever sleep. At this crucial moment, the gods who were watching all this time decided to finally take action against the goddess Aphrodite's wrongdoings. Hermes was instructed to report to the god Eros all the misfortunes that his beloved wife was going through. Profoundly touched, the god gradually recovered from the wound of her betrayal and flew off to start looking for her. On his arrival, she was lying exhausted beside his mother's garden, and it took him an instant to wipe off the enchantment from her eyes back into the box, then awaken Psyche from her deep slumber. Upon the joy of their reconciliation, Eros sought the permission of Zeus to take Psyche up to heaven to make sure that his mother would never give them any more trouble. The chief of the Olympians consented to what the god of love asked then announced to all divinities including Aphrodite, of her son's formal marriage. And as a wedding gift, Zeus proposed to bestow immortality upon the bride. The beautiful Psyche was thus elevated straight up to Olympus, where she was deified by consuming ambrosia, and accepted to live with the god of love as his immortal wife. This union became eminently suitable for Aphrodite as she couldn't refuse a goddess to be her daughter-in-law, and no doubt that having Psyche living up in heaven with a husband and children to care for, could no longer be much on earth to interfere with her own worship. Just like a fairy tale everything came to the most happy ending. With such a considerable allegorical content, the story of Eros and Psyche in Apuleius's second century Metamorphoses stands apart from the ordinary mythology of the Greek god Eros. The myth may have inspired several later retellings in which love is generally put on a test. Among them we can consider the well-known fairy tale of the beauty and the beast. In the love story of Eros and Psyche, we clearly see that it's an impossible matter trying to keep love imprisoned, the one feeling able to rise you above difficulties that life throws your way. It's the perseverance of a man possessed by passion and the efforts of a woman that overcame many obstacles in order to achieve the great happiness of love. Despite a multitude of sore trials and misfortunes, with Eros representing love and Psyche personifying the human soul purified by passion, finally found each other and this union will never be broken. This alliance would often lead many to interpret it as to be the fundamental understanding of love being deeply and intricately connected with the soul, which is at the source of each and every single life. Such a powerful emotion that could even transcend the fatality that represent death. 
Before ending this video there's something that I would like to share that many often don't or fail to realize. Although pure love is so strong that it could make you accomplish the impossible, let's not turn a blind eye to the fact that it could also destroy us with the same exact intensity. Once it has been betrayed, it can inevitably bring forth such unbearable pain and misery which could actually fill you with hatred, if you're not strong enough to overcome and forgive the person who hurt you. So keep in mind that the way you love and cherish people around yourself, could turn your feelings around in case you lose that trust and fidelity you had for them. Where there's light existing somewhere, there will always be shadows to be found simply because nothing is perfect in this world. Of course this is something I would consider to leave to your own thinking so do feel free to share with me in the comments below. Hopefully this video was interesting and worth your time, if so then don't forget to subscribe comment and share in order to make other people enjoy it just like yourself. In case you have anything you would like to be discussed, let me know in the comments and I'll do my best to make a video about it. And as always. Stay curious.